Uh, first, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, Stephanie Wiesenhaan. Stephanie is uh, trained as a veterinarian and uh, worked in the animal disease response policy with the Ministry of Agriculture in the past for a long time uh, before changing to the Ministry of Health. She is involved in the prevention and response policy on zoonotic and infectious diseases. In the last three years, she has worked with large dedication on the COVID and pandemic preparedness in the Netherlands. And uh, for that, uh, I've been working with her for a long time. So I'm, I'm very happy, Stephanie, uh, to invite you to share your ideas about the pandemic preparedness in the Netherlands. Uh, and um, I, the floor is yours. Okay, let's see if this works. Yes, it does. I'm, um, I need this. Um, I have a lecture on pandemic preparedness in the Netherlands. And I will uh, also talk a bit about a, a multi-sectoral approach, but it's not really in the lecture. So I'm gonna go through this uh, a bit quicker. And then uh, I'll uh, try and fit something in uh, about the multi-sectoral approach. Oh, wait, we have uh, robust, flexible and scalable. That's uh, what we are going to be. Uh, we have in the Ministry of Health, we have a unit that uh, is especially uh, made for pandemic preparedness. So uh, they can build, they don't have to uh, do uh, all the uh, normal infectious uh, disease uh, protection and prevention, but they can build on pandemic preparedness, which is really good to have people who can only focus on that because otherwise it snows under in the day-to-day -day work. So the lesson that we learned is uh, pandemics are a societal crisis and not just a healthcare crisis. So that's very multi-sectoral. And well, we have been talking about that. Huh? Trust is key, but how do, you, how do you get people to trust you? It's really difficult because if you tell too much and uh, you say you don't know things, then you think, yeah, if they don't know, uh, who is supposed to know? So it's, it's difficult to tell about insecurities, but also uh, state what you would like people to do. Another a thing that we learned is to take into account behavioral aspects and communication. So we have a special group on that by uh, at RIVM. Be open to solutions other than medical interventions and invest in innovations. And uh, also what we, uh, what pandemic preparedness there, we are trying not to be prepared for COVID because we've had that, but it's difficult to be prepared for something you don't know what will come, but we're trying to do that. And it takes investments. It takes uh, money, people, time. So we're trying to uh, regulate that uh, too. Well, this is, uh, well, we have to do it with, uh, with in the European Union and they are also uh, uh, in implementing lessons learned. So we have to uh, look at that too. And even, of course, the global perspective with the WHO. The pillars from pandemic preparedness in the Netherlands are strengthening public health. So that's what we're doing with the uh, AVM and uh, what's uh, GGD? The national health planning. And uh, the other thing is that we have to have our healthcare be better prepared because we, we have found that they are not prepared. Also, uh, where uh, people are longer, so the, uh, where older people are, they are not. They were not prepared at all, really. So we have to uh, make sure they are prepared and strengthen security of supply and access to medical products, because every country has their uh, one million mouth uh, face mask uh, story. We have, we have even we have far worse stories about a face mask, but won't bore you with them. In the uh, framework, we are looking at governance. Uh, we're looking at uh, international uh, strategy and collaboration. We are lo looking at knowledge, innovation and developments and uh, data sharing. It uh, was already mentioned today that uh, data sharing, that we should uh, do something about that in policy. Well, we're trying our best, but it's, uh, it's not simple data sharing. There's a lot of things uh, that can go wrong with that. Our objective are to prevent pandemics, limit mortality and uh, morbidity, morbidity, limit economic impact, that's an, another one, and limit societal impact. And these uh, two are 
well, they're not new exactly, but it's new that we, that there's this explicit. Because normally public health crisis would be uh, to limit morbidity and mortality, but we have seen in COVID that's not enough. You have to also uh, take into account economic and societal impact. So we are making a national preparedness plan uh, and there's all, there's a lot of points we are looking at, but uh, I think it is good that, uh, that I tell something about the multi-sectoral uh, approach here. We have in the Netherlands, with all sectors, made sector plans, or really they have made their own plans. So uh, there are plans for public transport, plans for schools, plans for the uh, for concerts, for cultural. They all made their own plans. They made them when in, I think in 2022, for if COVID would uh, rise up again. Well, it did not. But these plans can also be used for other pandemics. But what we have to do is we have to keep them alive, these plans, because they also made these plans in 2009, 2010 for the uh, influenza pandemic. And they must have been somewhere, but I don't think anyone has found them. So we have to make sure that the plans that they made for COVID, that they keep them alive and that they look at them like once a year, once every five years or uh, so we're trying to do that with all these sectors. And we have the help from uh, the Ministry of Social Affairs and Employment. They also have the societal impact team that was already mentioned uh, today, the societal impact team. And what they look at is the influence measures have on society. It's not really because you could say that that with that way you have uh, the public interest a bit more in your decision making, but they are also experts. So they're not public health experts, but they are societal experts. So it's it's not really citizens, but we're coming closer to the citizens. Let's say that. We also have help from the Ministry of Economic Affairs because they with their sectors, they look at uh, economic consequences of measures. So uh, that's it's, it's already far more integrated than it was before COVID. And we also, of course, have the Ministry of Agriculture, where I come from, who has the uh, diseases in animals uh, in their uh, uh, policy. But COVID, well, okay, we had it in I don't know what the English term is for Nerze. Mink, mink. We had it in mink, but we haven't got any mink anymore. So it's not coming back in mink, which is good. <laughs> uh, but we, of course, are, talk uh, are now talking a lot with the Ministry of Agriculture about avian flu. Because, well, that has been threatening us since 2005. Still hasn't happened yet, but it's it's well, it's it's making a comeback. So maybe that will be the next pandemic. So we really are working closely together with the Ministry of Agriculture now. Well, the thing is, it is difficult to keep all the other ministries and and units to keep them with us, because our job is public health, but they have other jobs and other policies where public health is a small percentage of. So now that COVID is over, they are going to go back to their normal work. So we will have to, uh, like the sectors, also the ministries, we have to try and keep them with us. And that's going to cost a lot of energy, I'm afraid. But we're going to do it because we have a national preparedness plan. Now, this is about... Uh, Oh yeah, we're trying to improve the flexibility of our health workforce, which is really difficult because they also have jobs to do all day and they haven't got very much room to be flexible, but we're trying to do this. And strengthen infectious disease prevention in long-term care facilities because that's of course difficult, 
because people live there. When you were in a hospital, yeah, well, it's it's okay. You are there for what a couple of days, maybe weeks. But people in long-term care facilities, that's where they live, that's their home. So uh, hygiene is important, but it cannot be as important as in hospitals. So the balance there is really difficult. Well, this is uh, fa face masks and things like that. And testing, because uh, Sandra has talked about testing and our test strategies and why did why did it take so long before everyone could be tested? Well, a big problem there was availability of uh, testing material. And we had a uh, gezant. We had somebody, especially in the Netherlands, who only job was search for uh, test facilities and test uh, stuffs and the things to put in your nose. And uh, he was really busy with that for months. But... In the end, we could test everyone, but it did take a long time. And there was also the multi-sectoral approach, because who would we want to test first? Police officers or people, the, the healthcare personnel or train uh, conductors or teachers. So there was also very multi-sectoral, I can tell. Well, when we're trying, of course, the stockpiling collaboration with the... Uh, with the European Union and with uh, HERA, and uh, so that's happening a lot. That's a global effort, it could be in cooperation. Oh, that was really quick. <laughs> so if anyone has questions. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie, for sharing with us uh, your uh, your experience and also the way forward uh, that uh, the ministry has taken. Uh, any questions? Yeah, Betty. My interest. We also like how you the different sectors that are in the ministry to talk about that. I missed one ministry, and that was that was one ministry that when we started vaccinating was very active in trying to get an award. It was the Ministry of Defense. Because they were very active in the uh, Mexican full vaccination program, and they, there were quite some people also in the media and the community yeah. and they said, We have all this experience. Yeah. Yes, what's their role now? They, and also in relation to what Vita said uh, with NATO, uh, what yeah. was. Well, uh, uh, the Ministry of Defense and, and all defense in the Netherlands they are sort of a world country itself. They have all their own thing. They have their own public health. They have their own vaccination program. They have uh, they do this all by by themselves, and they do really good. And they also have expertise in logistics and organizing things. And uh, we have uh, used their exp expertise on that. Uh, but um, there was a, well. The problem wasn't really the logistics as much because uh, we have uh, our municipal uh, public health uh, institutes who can really vaccinate, uh, well, we can vaccinate all the kids, they can vaccinate, uh, and now they can vaccinate against COVID really fast. Uh, so that, that, was, that was not really the problem uh, in logistics, but our problem uh, was, well, we. Our problem was uh, which part of vaccination do which people do, and in the Netherlands we, we like to give a share of all the work to everyone, so we have to talk with everyone, not citizens, but all the other ones we have talked with, and it's uh, that that takes some time, but in the end it works out really well. So. Uh, so we did have uh, some uh, people from the Ministry of Events to help us with the logistics and stuff, and with the uh, chain of command and things like that. But well, the rest of the Netherlands is not very impressed with uh, um, the chain of command uh, like they do with the Ministry of Events. So that did not work very well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think this was the last question. Um, oh, <laughs> no, Betty, go ahead. <laughs> well, of course, if I have the opportunity, there's a ministry on board. Uh, uh, 
We also talked about what well, the first paper did, the testing strategies, and the fact that we had we didn't run the material, but regards to that, we knew we were going to go to the personal computer setting up, we did that with Brussels and PCR testing. And then, indeed, there was a difficulty. And that's something, of course, that we don't want to happen again. But if there is anything we may have learned, that would be very important to be prepared at the beginning. Because you don't do count, you only can do it right once at the beginning. So there's one thing uh, uh, that I think that the, the, all, all the governments are involved in that, is to actually have to assert the supply uh, and not to be uh, dependent on the internal market. China, because that, as far as I remember, that we needed materials, uh, that they were materials, but for example, they were in China and we couldn't get them. And there were other materials uh, that we needed, and they were in our normal city, and we couldn't get them as well. Yeah. So you need to have somewhere uh, a, a sustained supply, which is a research. Uh, and, well, not only can we have the supply, they were saying that, but also the access to the yeah. to the to the supply. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, I'm not going to say it's, it's all taken care of, but it, it is uh, addressed as a problem that we don't want to have again. So uh, we are looking at cooperation in the EU, but also to uh, try and not be so dependent on uh, other countries outside of the EU. But, uh, uh, well, that is difficult, because you cannot stop fire everything. So you have to have your uh, either uh, contracts or you have to be able to make it in Europe. But then you have to have a market for uh, outside of the Netherlands, because yeah. nobody's going to produce things that are not going to be used uh, and are only going to be stockpiled. So, well, this is something where we are looking at. Again, not simple. No other questions. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. Then um, we go to the last speaker of today, uh, Mr. Kasper Druval Lanskan, if I pronounce uh, well. Um, He's acting head of the Secretariat of the Crisis Management Council of the Republic of Latvia since uh, 2017. Um, after completing the Master of Advanced Studies in Security Policy and Crisis Management at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich in 2011, he became head of Regional Military and Law Enforcement Liaison and Monitoring Unit in Luhansk Monitoring Team OSCE Special Monitoring Mission in Ukraine. Um, Mr. Drivalansk, um, I give you the floor for the last presentation on Latvia's government's responsibility during public health emergency preparedness and response. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kaspars, and um, don't pronounce my last name, it's even hard for me. I, you, I keep saying this in each meeting, so let's stay to, to, to just the name. And better to understand, you remember the movie Ghost Kaspars, that, that's me. So. Uh, the topic was the government's responsibility. You know, and if we, if we presume that public health emergency is part of national security, which is, then uh, I will speak a little bit more generally. And this will not be presentation like a Latvian experience. If I would speak about this, I for sure will not be here. So, <laughs> But this is like a dream and uh, assessment and uh, discussions and presentations that I'm trying to push to the politi politicians and to experts, to civil servants, to keep them together. And um, let's go. Firstly, we should clarify some things. We should talk about definitions. What kind of events are crises and what kind of events are not? That is important, in my opinion, that uh, the tactical and operational level agencies, including healthcare, as capable and resilient they are, then crisis will arrive later. So, which means the resilient resilience in each institution in the national security system is very important at that level. 
you know the principle that crisis must be dealt at the lowest level possible. This is the key. And sometimes, and later I will touch this point, um, uh, sometimes it's difficult to share responsibilities between experts or civil servants or, or professionals and with politicians. And there is also community which we were talking about how they should be involved. Are you out authorized to involve the community and public um, uh, agencies or something to join, to deal with crisis? This is the part which must be pre prepared before crisis. And, uh, sorry, and there is two factors, which is not my opinion, this already is agreed in uh, academic community, in professional community. As, uh, as better we live, then more vulnerable we are. That's true. We can see even by countries, by level, what is a crisis for us. Maybe we have an electricity blackout. Our lives are stopped. Everything is stopped. And maybe in some countries, they will not pay really big attention on that. Just an example. And the other principle uh, which makes things uh, worse, that in uh, modern societies, the citizens are expecting more. They are not tolerating, uh, well, let's say, vulnerability of the state to deal with uh, all the hazards uh, with public health, safety, and uh, prosperity. So, which means that all everything is so connected and uh, small thing in one sector can make worse disturbance and rapid development in, into deep crisis. So, and uh, there is two dimensions which I mentioned already, the technical dimension and the political dimension. And most of you are not politicians and you know that we are, let's say, subordinated somehow. We are not authorized by the, by the community, by the public to make all decisions we would like to. That's why we have politicians. So later I will also have this uh, learning from crisis. And I think many states didn't learn. We see communication in, in those levels, political and technical. Uh, let's say we are living in different worlds sometimes. So, and um, to com combine these two dimensions, it's challenging crisis managers. Firstly, to recognize and making sense of crisis, we should understand what happens. Making critical decisions, which means flexibility, improvisation, redundancy, and the breaking rules principle. But there is a question, are you allowed, are you authorized to do this? Maybe you are very well trained crisis manager, which can break the rules, can take those decisions, but uh, he's not protected because he is not pre-authorized. And the Latvian colleagues, uh, I think, will agree. We, in the last phases of uh, COVID crisis, we had a huge fight and misunderstanding, misacting with uh, those politician, political and uh, professional level. There is total misunderstanding, total. If we go step by step, the first wave and expectations of COVID, it was all of cabinet of ministers were looking at our eyes, what we supposed to do, what kind of decisions we should take. They were listening and following, right like in army. In the second wave, in an autumn in the first year, there was like a who will win, win-win process. And of course, this balance also is needed because crisis management is sometimes jumping out of the box, which they are not authorized to. And the, the, the second year, it was complete disaster with the crisis, from crisis management point of view. Those lessons is still not learned. And the learning from crisis, it's also, I think, is one missing point which, is, which I saw in many countries and also OECD uh, research show us, there is no, no clear questions on that, no clear answers on that. We, we don't know in how to translate in Latvian, but sometimes if you step on wrong uh, place twice and even more times, which means you don't learn, you didn't learn from the previous crisis. So, and uh, 
for effective crisis management, it's always important we should learn from the military guys because they are very good at planning. And uh, we have to establish clear crisis management structure at all levels. I'm talking about the operational, tactical, strategic. Everybody has to understand what he is responsible for and is allowed for. That's why we need these uh, clear, defined rules and responsibilities. And, of course, trained, prepared and competent personnel, which is also the case as a problem. And we, we have seen cycle, like preventive, active and uh, post-crisis measures. This is from crisis management ICO at uh, all, all levels where the principles, frameworks and processes are described. I think this cycle is very good that we use in similar way in different countries. It's better to coordinate between countries as well. So like some standards we should keep, but at the same time to have a, some kind of competition bet between the states to learn from each other who find the best way. Some international uh, comparisons so uh, you you will have the, the presentation later i will not read the slides but the some 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 principles we cannot take one excellent like my favorite crisis management system in the uk we cannot take them and implement in latvia there is cultural uh, geographical geopolitical many many difficult different entries also the history of the state building of the government and everything so it means we have to take things, best practice from others, which is relevant to us and we know how to deal. And here you see that some countries, institutionals and rules, in the Europe we have like centralized, where we have the top institution on the top and everything is subordinated. Then is another option which makes uh, some kind of networking and there is a hybrid system where is coordinating institution in charge and everybody is involved, including non-state uh, actors. And some findings. This is more about Latvia. So ministries and organizations and local authorities like municipalities, in the laws, regulations, there are quite clear responsibilities. But some of them are overlapping and some things we, we didn't cover at all. And there is some, let's say, holes, which always, uh, like Murphy rule, you know, it's always the crisis push exactly in, in that place. Some of uh, institutions are so over-regulated. So it means that we writing laws as uh, instructions, uh, and which doesn't allow to be flexible, resili resilient anymore, because our bureaucracy is just following the rules. Remember crisis management principle, break the rules. There is also conflicting. It cannot be anarchy, but, but you cannot, I keep saying it's maybe not, uh, let's say, politically correct, but you cannot change stupidity with regulation. Don't over-regulate things, let's say, uh, invest more on training, on uh, education and, and stuff like that. There is also lack of taking the lead. Like a COVID crisis, according to our national rule, the Ministry of Health is the leading institution. No questions according to the, rule, the law. But in the beginning, even first COVID didn't arrive in Latvia, we recognized that Ministry of Health is simply not able to deal especially with the consequences what the, this disease can, can bring. Because we had already Italy example and uh, we were quite, quite afraid. And the cap capabilities and capacity of the sector of the health in Latvia is quite low. So it means everybody has to be involved. And, uh, and then the Crisis Management Council like, took the over of responsibility, but still the Ministry of Health was the guilty one all worse things for economy, for, for freedom of movement, for all restrictions and uh, safety measures were pushed even also by political parties to the Ministry of Health. You know, and this fight during the crisis, if you don't have a, the common goal, understanding where we're going to and what is the problem, 
it's almost impossible to, to manage crisis as a crisis management. I, I was named, I, I named this uh, as, as a cabinet office is moderating things, but not uh, leading crisis, uh, having crisis management. And of course, of, of course, of course, but I, I don't like to talk about, but also the budget and all these uh, things, we don't have left budgets for R&D and things like this. There is just core functions for daily business. So which means the resilience and capability, almost of all sectors are quite weak. And it's difficult to explain to politicians, invest there and you will avoid a lot of problems in the nearest future. And there is also uh, playing football with responsibilities. If there is intersectoral crisis, the ministries are, 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 let's say, running away from that problem and trying to push this problem to run their one. And we're spending a lot of time which can be, can be uh, invested in preventive measures we're fighting who is responsible for. And this is almost, almost always. And also it's, it's uh, quite weak understanding what means on risk-based analysis planning process and uh, planning process includes of course investment and uh, and all those things uh, cooperation there is a uh, main partner institutions in crisis and disaster situations as i mentioned is supporting a leading role is uh, it's tricky even to identify if something happened and as you know all crisis now is a uh, is more and more cross-sectoral. There is no sectoral crisis anymore. And uh, institutions don't want to lead. And there is also at the political level because the leading ministries, let's say policy makers are ministries and they are shared by political parties, which again, the importance, even budgeting, it's always fight with the parties. And you cannot in long or even middle term uh, period to plan any functions. Dita can describe, she has a, a state emergency medicine uh, plan, which is financed at zero. So this plan is uh, like Mike Tyson said, you know, before the fight, you have a plan after first punch, your plan goes to garbage. This is always like this, but you know, during the planning, we, we training, we making scenarios, we at least thinking about that. But we should not presume that plan, we will follow the plan as a Bible, you know, and everything will happen. No, you have to be flexible to break the rules, to, to review the plan and, and do things, which means you have to be the person who is able to take decisions, break the rules, fight with politicians, even maybe you after will be fired, which happening quite often. Some conclusions. The public administration in, um, in Latvia, at least, and also I have seen in uh, many other countries are so fragmented, which goes to difficulties, what I mentioned about responsibilities. And uh, there should be a new system and some countries, as previous speaker mentioned in the Nieder Netherlands, I, I know the system and uh, we have a crisis management, management centers network, more than about uh, 30 countries, which is Let's say the secretariat is um, uh, from the from the Netherlands National Secure National Crisis Management uh, Center, and uh, we also trying to build new system in Latvia. I mean, we are the last state after COVID because we had just one lessons learned done quite professionally. I think according to uh, World Health Organization's uh, system, and there is also all the businesses, uh, communication, uh, management, and of course, uh, health healthcare. And, uh, and business continuity plans, many, because of not trained personnel, and there is no political will, the ministries as uh, policy makers in the sectors have those plans on the paper because regulation, the law says you're supposed to have that plan but you, if you look at this plan, even before crowds, it goes to bar garbage. So it doesn't work. It's just formality, which is wrong. As I mentioned, some overlapping and some, some, some things are not covered. Crisis management system, uh, institu institutions, if you talk after the crisis with responsible institutions, like after COVID with Ministry of Health, they, I think, 
fully agree that there must be at prime minister's level center authorized by him who can organize, coordinate, and even give orders to the ministries and parties and agencies before and during the crisis. So must be one commander on, on, on charge to deal with, but he must be able to invite all the players, all uh, even uh, municipalities and uh, NGOs to play with us. Like cooperation and being together for one goal is always working. If you're fighting with each other, it doesn't work. And there is also clear understanding uh, what is crisis management. It's difficult to speak uh, with colleagues in ministries because there is not that, this understanding and, uh, and uh, even academic uh, learning of, of this. But after COVID, of course, everybody in Latvia, if you see in the, in the news, in the media, in TV, radio or something, the same experts who were commenting and saying what we're supposed to do during the COVID-19, the same people speak about the war in Ukraine, you know, and they are experts of, on everything, which is also, let's say, the trust of this is not quite high. Because to play others is much more easier to, than to work together. And there was some uh, recommendations that the crisis management concept with clear responsibilities, which must be included in all legislations, must be in place, but not over-regulated, authorized. Also, this business continuity plans, as I mentioned, it's supposed to be that they are um, useful during crisis. Not the Bible, but useful. And the personnel who are working on that are trained. Institutional structure and competence in all levels to include all the cooperation mechanisms with partner networking, national, international relation, research institutions, NGOs, everything. As you know, the research institutions in the COVID, they were so, so useful. And, uh, and also the profiles and competencies framework for crisis management. This must be position with clear, clear rights, with clear uh, responsibilities in each agency, in each institution, that they can be networked and they, when they discuss about crisis management, they can be in the same page, let's say, like this. And of course, all the plans and all the activities must, must be uh, financially and technically uh, resourced. There is four options. And uh, I would pay attention on uh, option three and option four, which was also the OECD recommendations to establish strong and, uh, and resilient centers of governments. Because they are only in the democratic systems who are like over ministries and, uh, and can deal with. Or establish special institutions that some countries have. This shame just shows who must be involved and how the work can be organized in a centralized way where the ministries and services and will involved like a crisis players. Crisis management consultation platform, there also should be between the, all the democratic uh, players like media, lawmakers, uh, governments, parl the parliaments, uh, president, if, if, if we have, must be a platform before any activity they discuss. Firstly, they, they receive clear and honest information in concentrated way, and they can discuss and, and hear from crisis managers what they plan to do and why they're planning that. But this platform doesn't have a right to decide. This is just a consultation platform. And then we have the profile working groups, working groups which can work in preventive and also during the crisis. Task force, if we identify new risks, we can create a task force to, to work on it. All the cycle again, pro from preventive to active and uh, post-crisis. Municipalities, again, deal with crisis in the lowest possible level. We also have, let's say, on daily basis, fight between government and municipalities. It's always difficult to have this conversation. And then this crisis management center is like some kind of uh, something between politicians and uh, and municipalities to 
somehow balance this uh, fights. And of course, Sitzen or Joint Operation Room, where the all information from all sectors, from all duty rooms are coming in one, uh, are, are arriving in one place, and they are analyzed, and based on this, this information can be discussions about some kind of decisions. What responsibilities you can read later, there is nothing new, the, the, the cycle, and the center is supposed to have four, five actually sections, the liaison between players, I mean municipalities, agencies, and everything, and information, like crisis communication, which is very important in our modern societies, because we're receiving information from many places, we have a lot of allegations and uh, fake news, whatever. And I was in one seminar where, um, where uh, Scandinavian colleagues were presenting how they deal with, and this is the principle what, which I, let's say, supporting, my, my full support on that. But in advance, we should have one platform, even in, uh, let's, let's say, in the medicine, where is the honest and true information? and not to pay attention, all the bubbles are going around. Because people, when, are, when they are affected, they're trying to, to, to find the correct information, the correct recommendations, they trust you. And uh, the visitors of this page during the COVID was increasing totally. The number was just uh, unbelievable. So in this operations section, planning section, logistics section, and finance and admin are the key key, key uh, sections which the center is supposed to have. And how to de develop that, that kind of things? Firstly, political will. The academic society, citizens, experts, agencies, we should push politicians to think about. Because if there is no uh, request, there is no action. We know how democratic works. After the COVID, we have political initiatives to, to, set up, to, to set up that kind of system, which works. Because everybody was blaming what we have. But this is not easy thing. There is some kind of jealousies and all, all this uh, quite human uh, relative things. And of course, if you plan budget also based on data and risk assessment, you can, you can uh, reach the goals. And we should build a one-time momentum to agree timelines. And standard theory of change, I think you are quite familiar with. And uh, one of my colleague, which I respect very much, he said, during the tri crisis, if you don't know what to do, do it right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this uh, extensive presentation. I think this is very informative, uh, uh, what you have presented. Um, let me first go to the audience. Uh, are there any questions for clarification? No, otherwise, uh, I was... Uh, I mean, it was too clear or too worse? <laughs> I just uh, I just wanted to reflect on the fact that um, that your presentation crystallised for me is that the whole ch um, prob problem is under resourced. So people not assigned time, not assigned money, not assigned. The the, the solution is not resourced, are they? We've got um, somebody mentioned earlier on. We've got public health institutes taking responsibility. But they they are funded in a way that just covers their operation. Um, it doesn't necessarily allow for uh, setting up completely new functions. But at this preparedness planning is a is a or crisis management is a new function. Am I right? It's but it is. But uh, again, we are not deciding. We are proposing. You know and. Uh, um, it's also like an approach of municipalities. This is like a soldier in military, military service receiving letter from the mom, and she's asking, how are you doing, son? The answer, everything is good, send money, will be better, you know, and this is always a communication. I think before you request for uh, resources, 
tell what for, what is the goal you will reach. And then already is the political uh, level when you prioritize. The resources are never enough, you know, and uh, I think this is a part of good planning, but, but it should not be, in my opinion at least, it's not like in the bank, you have uh, the box of money and then you think what to do with this. No, you firstly uh, put on the table your goals and the needs and the risks. And if you are as a politician, you don't act on risk, which is mentioned before, it's already your responsibility. Well, Did I answer your question? Thank you. Well, it's a um, question in line I had is you present it like uh, there has been a study done or a review. So I was, was wondering what, uh, who did this and uh, how is that related then to the commitment uh, of the government to, uh, to take these recommendations into practice when then it comes to resources. But has it been, was no. it a review or who's, uh, who's done this extensive work? No, I was fighting with government uh, more than 30 years, but, uh, but uh, I will keep fighting. But uh, this is, again, the, the lack of competencies. We have no, in that, that region, uh, let's say schools, where to be educated on the crisis management or disaster management, you know. And, uh, you know, if you, if you don't have here, then you have to go somewhere to learn this from each other. And uh, again, it's difficult to, to have this political will. And uh, sometimes the experts on this uh, field, what I mentioned, uh, this um, uh, technical, it's sometimes uh, everybody knows what to do, but there is no, nobody is uh, listening or hear what you're saying about uh, the needs, what is not, not for me, for the community, for the state, you know. Yeah, it, uh, it might sometimes help that uh, external people uh, review or evaluate, uh, like we said in the beginning, the PDCA cycle. And that's why there are a lot of after-action reviews and intra-action reviews done as also advised by the WHO. So that uh, you get also commitment from the government uh, for, for the outcome of the review and the recommendations to, yeah, to have commitment for... To, to bring it a step further, but that's, it's, it's not easy. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay, I just, no, I just wanted to add for the information on this after action reviews. Actually, we had one and the government's responsibility was uh, kind of uh, evaluated or assessed, but uh, unfortunately the results and recommendations for from this after action review they are not, let's say, taken into account or followed up. So, yeah, we will, we will still work on that, but there was a part where in, in this, uh, of course, the, the Ministry of Health, as uh, Kasper said, as a crisis uh, uh, main uh, organization um, for, or sector responsible for this COVID uh, pandemic, response was evaluated or assessed but as well this governmental perspective was taken into account also a little bit to add we we after the covid we have established the parliamentary investigation commission one of the assessments were exactly what i'm saying now there's supposed to be one of the one of one in charge who dealt with because in national security law the to deal responsible for dealing with the threats to the state is direct responsibility to prime minister. But he has no, or she has no muscle, some brain to deal with. There is no institutions behind to work with. And this is just again, the, like a, like a lozung, legal lozung, which is, which doesn't work. And, uh, and there was a second, we also after, just before elections last autumn, we got the, report from the state audit in civil protection field, which was, uh, let's say, critical is the, the lightest word I can use. And there was also one of, one of the main recommendations, make the structure clear with clear responsibilities. And uh, new parties which uh, were running for elections last year, they also had in the programs for a long, long time 
to, to, to make sure that uh, the state has kind of crisis management system. And now there's some activities is ongoing, but you never know, you know, sometimes if you ask to idiot to bless God, he will smash the face, you know, this is sometimes difficult thing. <laughs> And do you think the new EU regulation uh, will help in that sense, that is also meant for countries to give insight in their preparedness and also to come up with a plan for improvement that, for instance, uh, the ECDC can do an external uh, visit? Yes, it sometimes, it sometimes work that uh, from, um, at least in Latvia, there's sometimes recommendations from outside taking much more serious than uh, from inside. I'm sometimes even asking to my colleagues, please come inside from the other doors, you know, that sometimes it works much better. But these already practical points, which uh, doesn't change the meaning, you know. Um, I guess I, I am concerned renewing the, the issue of resourcing. Um, I think we know our memories are short as COVID is dwindling. Uh, is the receiving visit. I would be very worried about our future resources of preparedness. Now we, you know, we know there are risks, we look at the, the horizon, the landscape in terms of the influenza, you know, um, uh, our fever, for example, CDRM, or hazards, um, and we know there are, there are threats out there. Um, but when I see the, the like, picture of the DM, the preparedness, or the, the DM, Fully, but you know, if to be honest, I was just thinking in, in my in my own. If next year, like uh, next uh, March, the COVID arrives again in the same way as it used to be, or the, it was, I'm not sure that we would be better prepared. Maybe we would act differently, but I'm not sure sure about the results, because from the actions, practical actions, I don't see. Uh, big change. Dita, do you have face masks more in the uh, comedy reserves? I don't think so. Do you have more capabilities in the hospitals? No. And this shows that we don't know from the, from the previous crisis. You know, with the risks, if you deal correctly the cycle, you are quite strong because you're always in the, like a, like a sportsman, you know, you are, you are in good mood. And, uh, and the risk assessment, the first stage you do, is uh, the important one. Because um, uh, if with the risks, what you can do, you can solve, you can mitigate, or you can accept. But by those two, three decisions, they have consequence in the next actions on, during the planning. You need more resource for, for dealing with if you accept the, the risks and, uh, and threats. And this is always, you know, quite complex. And maybe in one sector you do it right, but you steal something, the security, I mean, from the other sectors, including resource. That's why it must be balanced and clear understanding. We should, I know we are selfish, we are human beings, you know, and if you are uh, representatives from the medicine, from the health sector, you are thinking about this one, but there is a lot of other needs and that's why it must be balanced. And there are sometimes politicians, politicians help and sometimes really not, you know. That's why we have to look a little bit uh, more open. Of course, be selfish. Who will fight for you? Nobody else except you. But you must be, let's say, tolerant and discuss your needs with your possible partners which you will need during the crisis or preparation. 
if you are selfish, you got the much more money or resource you, 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 you can, but you are enemy to everybody else. So you will be alone with your money. You know, this is again, but this is philosophy already. I think you want to talk about the practical things more. Okay, thank you very much, Gaspar. Well, it's we we need we we need both practical and uh, philosophy, uh, I think, and also uh, inspirational. I think it was a very uh, uh, comprehensive um, presentation to end uh, the first day, uh, and. I think uh, also don't get demotivated. We cannot do everything at once. Some things uh, need more time uh, than the other things. And um, uh, it is a bit an invitation or the, the step for tomorrow to look in our circle of influence, uh, what we can uh, do uh, to uh, improve preparedness uh, uh, in the multisectoral dimension. You will find in your mailboxes the presentations uh, of today. Thank you, Indra, for uh, taking care of that. And so today we have heard a lot about multisectoral cooperation regarding what does what do we mean with it? Well, I, there is still a lot of exploration uh, uh, possible, but at least for the laboratory dimensions, uh, for the public and citizen participation dimension and the uh, governance uh, dimension, we have uh, elaborated on that. So uh, it's time to uh, let everything uh, settle down. Um, and thank you very much for your uh, patience. Uh, you did a good job until the end. Um, very well done. And uh, relax, enjoy, and have fun. <laughs>